Thank you very much for being here today, and thanks to Rory and the team for inviting me. I'm really excited to tell you about some of my recent work uh, on moral decision making. So Michael Rice was a 48-year-old assistant manager at a Walmart. And one day he was helping a customer carry a television to her car when he suffered a major heart attack. He was rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately he died a week later. Michael was survived by his wife and two children. Luckily, he had a life insurance policy that paid out $300,000. Unfortunately for Michael's family, they didn't see a cent of that money. Instead, all the money went to Walmart. You see, the company had purchased Michael's life insurance policy and named itself as the beneficiary. And they had done this without Michael's knowledge. When Michael's widow found out about the life insurance policy, she was outraged. Michael had been exhausted from overworking at the company, sometimes 80 hours a week. And she said, they use Mike terribly, and then they go out and collect $300,000. It's very immoral. So there seems to be something morally repugnant about profiting from the suffering of others, even when the person or organization who profits is not directly responsible for that suffering. And this idea was in fact tested directly in a recent psychology study by Yoel Inbar, Dave Pizarro, and Fiery Cushman. So in the study, participants read about Mr. Green, a, a money manager at a large financial firm who invested in catastrophe bonds. In the harm condition, the bonds only became valuable if a severe earthquake were to strike a developing country in the next two years. In the no harm condition, the bonds only became valuable if a severe earthquake did not strike a developing country in the next two years. Now in both conditions, Mr. Green profits handsomely from the bonds, and then participants are asked, what is their opinion of Mr. Green? Now it turns out, even though there's no way Mr. Green could be responsible for an earthquake striking a distant, distant country, it turns out when he profits from that earthquake, people perceive him to be less moral, less trustworthy, and more blameworthy. So profiting from the pain of others indeed affects our moral judgments of other people. But how does it affect our own behavior? So I'd like you to take a minute to think about the first moral rule that comes to mind. Probably it's some variation of the rule, do no harm. And indeed, universal moral codes prohibit harming others for purely selfish benefits. And this principle is articulated elegantly in Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. He writes, for one man unjustly to promote his own advantage by the loss or disadvantage of another is more contrary to nature than death, than poverty, than pain, than all the misfortunes which could affect him. But Adam Smith wasn't the first to point out the moral costs of profiting from wrongdoing. In fact, we can trace this sentiment back at least until biblical times when we see the first mention of the concept of filthy lucre, which is money gained through dishonest or dishonorable means. Now the way that we talk about filthy lucre, or dirty money, or blood money, or ill-gotten gains, suggests that the very value of money might be diminished by immoral associations. In other words, money might feel less valuable to us when it's obtained through an immoral action. Today I'm gonna to show you some experiments that provide some evidence for this idea. In these experiments, we bring people into the lab and we give them the opportunity to profit financially from other people's pain. Now the pain is in the form of electric shocks and these shocks don't do any permanent damage so they're well within the range of what we can do ethically in the lab, but they are unpleasant enough that people will give up money to avoid them. They feel a little bit like a wasp sting that lasts for half a second, or like briefly putting your hand under very hot water. So in our experiments, we bring two participants into the lab, and they're led to different rooms, they arrive at different times, so they don't see one another or interact with one another, and the, their identities remain totally confidential. Then they go through a pain thresholding procedure individually. We use an electric stimulation device to determine each participant's pain threshold. And we use this threshold to create a bespoke shock stimulus for each person that is 
quite unpleasant, but not intolerable. And importantly, we match the subjective unpleasantness of these shocks for the two participants. Um, so each is getting a level eight on a 10 point scale, where 10 is an intolerable level of pain. Next, what we do is we randomly assign these two participants into the roles of decider and receiver. And then the decider completes a decision task. And the task looks like this. The decider has to choose between a smaller amount of money plus a smaller number of shocks or a larger amount of money plus a larger number of shocks. Now, the money is always for the decider. It's always for, for the self. But the shocks are sometimes for the decider and sometimes they're for the receiver, who's in the other room. This is a person that the decider doesn't know, they're never going to meet or see again, but they know that the other person is there. So in the study, the deciders make a number of choices between different amounts of money and different amounts of pain. And then from their choices, we can work out each person's exchange rate between money and pain, when the pain is for themselves or when the pain is for the other person. In other words, this translates to how much money a person would need to be paid to increase the level of shocks, the number of shocks, to either themselves or this other person. Now, we have sampled hundreds and hundreds of people in this paradigm in many experiments over the past few years, and we've observed a very wide range of behaviors in this setting. We have people who refuse to deliver a single shock to another person, even for a profit of 20 pounds. At the other end of the spectrum, we have people who are willing to deliver 20 painful shocks to another person for a profit of 10p. <laughs> These also happen to be the people who score very highly on questionnaire measures of psychopathy, which probably shouldn't come as a great shock. So before I go any further, I want to mention a couple of things that we're doing our best to not measure with this task. We want to rule out a couple of possible explanations for why people might behave pro-socially but not actually devalue money gained from immoral means. So one possib po possible reason people might behave pro-socially in this setting is they care about their reputation. So I might not actually care about what happens to the other person, but I care about the experimenter or what other people think of me. So to rule this out, we make the decisions totally private. The deciders are sitting in a room by themselves as they make these decisions. Uh, their name or identifying information is not linked to their data anyway. So there's no way that either the receiver or we, the experimenters, can find out what an individual decider has chosen in the task. Another reason why people might be nice in this setting is reciprocity. Maybe they're afraid that the receiver is going to retaliate in some way. But we, we rule out this motive by telling the deciders it's a one-way interaction, the receiver isn't going to have the opportunity to punish them afterwards, and indeed, because the identities are kept confidential, there's no way that the decider and the receiver could run into each other on the street later and know that they had both been involved in this experiment. So what this really allows us to do is to isolate as best as we can the value of profits gained from an immoral action, so harming somebody else, versus the value of profits gained from an amoral action, so harming only yourself. So our key question is, how do people feel about these profits gained from harming others versus profits gained from harming themselves? And to answer this question, we can compare how much money people are willing to give up to prevent the pain to either themselves or others. Now, decades of research in economics show that at least when it comes to money, people do care about others' welfare a little bit, but they care far more about their own welfare. So from economics, we have a very straightforward prediction that people might pay some money to prevent pain to others, but this should be far less than the amount they're willing to pay to prevent pain in themselves. But if our prediction is correct, if people have moral principles which degrade the value of profits that come from an immoral action, then we may find that people may be willing to give up more money to prevent pain in others than themselves, because the former is worth less to them than the latter. So before I show the results, I'd just like to take a quick poll of the audience, and if you're familiar with these results, please abstain from voting. So please raise your hand if you think the economics perspective is right, that people will pay more to prevent pain in themselves than others. Show of hands. All right, 
this is a behaviorally informed group, uh, show of hands if you think that people will pay more to prevent pain in others than themselves. Well, the optimists have it. So, reassuringly, the ethical perspective wins the day. We've done a number of studies. Here are the first two that we did. We used very different methods to elicit these preferences. Um, but consistently, people would rather profit from their own pain than from other people's pain. People show what we call hyper-altruistic preferences. And that term comes from the fact that not only are people altruistically willing to sacrifice some money to prevent pain to others, they're actually willing to give up more money to prevent pain in others than themselves. So here, I've arranged our participants from the least to the most hyper-altruistic. And you can see here the majority of people are, in fact, hyper-altruistic. And the range of hyper-altruism that we observe is greater than the range of selfishness that we observe. So the big question, of course, is how can we explain hyper-altruism? Now remember, we're comparing exchange rates for profit and pain that goes to self and other. And it could be that our hypothesis is correct, that the value of money is diminished when that money comes from an immoral action relative to an amoral action. But there's an alternative possibility that we haven't yet ruled out. It could be that people simply find others' pain more aversive than their own pain, and therefore it's appropriate to pay more to reduce others' pain than your own pain. One way that we can rule out this explanation is to take money out of the equation entirely. In other words, we can ask people simply to exchange or divide pain between themselves and another person. So that's what we did in another study with my collaborators at UCL. We asked participants to divide 24 shocks between themselves and another person, again, a person that they have not seen are not going to meet. We also manipulated the framing of the choice. So in the give frame, participants were able to give some shocks to the other person. In the take frame, participants were able to take some shocks away from the other person. And finally, in the give or take frame, participants could either give or take shocks from the other person. Now what we find across all three frames is that the splits of pain between self and other are not significantly different from a 50-50 split. In other words, we're not finding any strong evidence that people find others' pain inherently more aversive than their own pain which provides support for our other, other idea, supporting that profits gained from harming others might be less valuable than profits gained from harming oneself. Now, one thing we might ask is, what happened to this extra bit of value? Where did it go? One possibility is that when people make these decisions, they're thinking about the moral consequences of their actions. And this could induce a sort of self-regulation process, an extra cognitive step whereby the initial value of the money gets downgraded because of its moral consequences. Now this leads to a quite specific prediction about how long people will take to make these kinds of decisions. If moral decisions involve an extra processing step that degrades the value of money based on its consequences, then people should take longer to decide when their choices can affect others compared with when their choices can affect only themselves. And this should happen only in the people who actually behave morally. And this is exactly what we find. So on average, in the group, people take longer to make these choices when their choices can affect another person compared with when their choices can affect only oneself. And furthermore, the extent to which people slow down when they're choosing for others relative to themselves predicts hyperaltruism, or the extent to which they're willing to pay more to prevent pain in others than themselves. It seems there is a good reason why we describe moral behavior using words like thoughtful and considerate. Incorporating moral values into our choices often takes time. So how might this regulation process take place in the brain? Research in neuroscience suggests that selfish impulses can be restrained by top-down control over reward processes. And within this circuitry, the prefrontal cortex, so this bit of the brain at the front, regulates responses to rewards in the striatum. But a brain chemical called dopamine can disrupt this circuitry. This leads to a prediction that if we boost levels of dopamine in our participants, we might interfere 
with this top-down control process and thereby eliminate hyperaltruism. So we tested this in the lab by giving participants either a placebo pill or a drug called L-DOPA, which increases levels of dopamine in the brain. And this drug has pretty subtle effects. So when you're on the drug, you actually can't tell whether you've received the drug or whether you've received placebo. So we gave our participants the drug, and then we had them do the decision-making task that I showed you earlier. And what we find is on placebo, as before, participants are hyperaltruistic. They require more compensation to shock others than themselves. But when we give them the drug that boosts dopamine levels, we eliminate hyperaltruism. People are no longer hyperaltruistic when they received a boost of dopamine. Now, in this study, of course, we manipulated dopamine levels in the lab, but it's important to point out, of course, there are many stimuli out in the world that also boost dopamine. Some examples that come to mind are money, sex, and drugs. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, environments that are teeming with these dopamine stimulators, money, sex, and drugs, seem to be breeding grounds for bad behavior. So, in conclusion, we found evidence in the lab for hyperaltruistic preferences. People require more financial compensation to increase pain in others than to harm themselves. Now, the reason for this does not seem to be that people find others' pain inherently worse than their own pain, but rather, people really seem to dislike profiting from the pain of others. And we can see these moral preferences both in behavior as well as in our moral judgments of other people. In the brain, dopamine can disrupt these moral preferences, which should make us think about what behavior might be like in environments with a lot of these dopamine-stimulating cues. So what are the implications of these findings for institutions, organizations, and individuals? Well, first of all, our aversion to profiting from harm might be harnessed to increase consumers' demand for ethical products. We might do this by making more salient the fact that consumers often benefit from low prices. They profit um, from cheap prices that come at the cost of harm or welfare to workers, to animals, and to the environment. Secondly, our moral intuitions profoundly impact the way that we evaluate our leaders. Although we're easily impressed by signals of wealth, status, and power, we are far less likely to trust those whose wealth and power come from dishonest or immoral means than, than moral means. And this is probably one reason why voters care so much about seeing the tax returns and the financial statements of their candidates. It matters to us where the money comes from. In our studies, the people who are willing to profit the most from harm to others are those who score highest on measures of psychopathy. Our attitudes towards profit signal our core moral character. Finally, our findings serve an important reminder of how our environments can shape our behavior. Cues that stimulate dopamine release might tilt people towards self-interest, something that we might consider when we're trying to design environments that promote pro-social behavior and discourage selfishness. So to finish, I'd just like to thank my collaborators in my lab in Oxford and to you for your attention. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. You. you have got time for two questions. Okay. I mean, do you think there's a concomitant thing that I've often wondered that uh, charities, which sometimes actually do quite harmful things, mm. but are deemed to be well-intentioned and altruistic to begin with, get given quite a soft ride if they actually do harm uh, unintentionally, whereas businesses, uh, we tend to downgrade, for example, the benefits they do and actually hold them to a higher moral account. Would that square with what you're seeing here, effectively? Yes. That, that, that to profit from the misfortune of someone else is just peculiarly a sort of tainted mm. activity. Yes. And, but likewise, when something, I, I've often wondered about that, that actually uh, quite a lot of charitable or pro-social, you know, activity which is branded as pro-social, mm -hmm. which may in many cases, to be honest, actually create more harm than good. We give those people a remarkably soft ride because the original intent is 
that matters almost as much as the outcome. Is that fair? Yes, the magic word here is intent. So research on our moral judgment of others who profit from, from misfortune um, squarely depends on the, the, the intent or the perceived intent of that individual. So I think charities are probably perceived as having better intent and therefore they get let off the hook more than businesses who might be perceived as having the intent of profit seeking. So the right kind of profit motive is a kind of moral force, assuming the people who are actually engaged in that aren't psychopaths, you would say. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. So, but, but I mean, equally, you could argue that the shareholder value movement or something of that kind, or looking at very short-term returns as a business incentive, is almost a way of promoting psychopathy in businesses. Uh, is that, is that a, would you, would you, you may not want to extend it that far. But <laughs> I'm not sure our data speaks there, to there that. Is, there, is, there is a question where certain forms of economic doctrine seem to be very effective ways of producing companies that nobody likes, I suppose, sure. is, is what I'm driving <laughs> at. No, questions, we've got time for two. Gentleman there was very fast. Um, yep, in the pink shirt. Thank you. I'm wondering how much you think that this um, aversion to pain in others is something kind of visceral in us mm. or tangible. Like, I don't know if, if the people in your study could see through a one-way mirror or something, the people getting shocked. Or, so, like, if there was two, you know, your, your mm. barn eggs and your whatever they are, the factory eggs, if they had a picture of a horribly treated chicken and a nice chicken, would that change the way we bought them? And, do you know, do we have to kind of experience the mm. other's pain somehow or see it? rather than just intellectualizing that it might happen. Yes, I do think that the aversion to harm is quite visceral and primitive. Uh, in our experiments, our participants didn't actually see the other person, but they had experienced the shocks themselves. They knew how painful they were before they started making those decisions. We actually tried to do a similar set of studies where instead of painful electric shocks, we used uh, unpleasant sounds. And that didn't work. Uh, we haven't published that. But um, the fact that we see this very strong effect with physical pain, but not with other kinds of aversive outcomes, suggests to me there might be something special about pain and physical suffering. Just, um, yeah, you, you say it's quite visceral, yet it was the prefrontal cortex, which is a relatively late evolutionary addition. Mm that seems to be doing the work. Is that, am I right there or not? That's true, well that's, that's a hypothesis and we, 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 are, we are doing, doing studies with neuroimaging to flesh out the, these ideas a bit more. I think that ultimately it's an interaction between a very visceral uh, gut reaction to harm and uh, later evolved prefrontal cognitive strategies that represent the fact that it's not okay to harm other people for profit. I suppose the other thing you can't factor out of the experiment is a belief in God, which is if sure. you believe there's someone omnipresent and omniscient watching you who might punish you, that even though reputation is factored out for practical exactly. purposes, you do believe that fundamentally some, you know, someone's watching you. Sure, or, or you don't even need to bring God into the equation. You can also just account for the fact that people have their own self -perception. Their view of self, their, yeah. their reputation with, their, with themselves, and this is a really powerful force in moral behavior. We want to see ourselves as good people. So we almost have an internal reputation, which is how exactly. we actually think of ourselves. Exactly. Okay, oh, that's interesting. Next question, sorry, oh my goodness. Okay. We're going to extend it to three because that was a dead heat. Lady there first. <laughs> uh, I, can't, I can't decide between you. Lady there first and then the uh, lady in the corner. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. That's, it. That's it. I'm just wondering if it's got any links to um, Antonio Damasio's work because um, he seems to say that uh, our moral behaviours are embedded in somatic markers in our body and... Um, in order to access them, we need to slow down more. Mm. So linking back to our earlier talk as well, by becoming faster, we've got less access to that emotional somatic marker, and therefore we become more immoral. That's a great question, and I think highlights a, a really uh, unanswered question in the field right now, where on the one hand, there's a lot of evidence that we have impulses to be pro-social. We have sort of intu we're intuitive cooperators. And there's a lot of research showing that when you put people under time pressure, uh, they're actually more likely to cooperate in economic games than when you make them wait a long time before they make their decision. But on the other hand, uh, there's our research, there's, there's other studies suggesting that uh, you actually need to slow down to implement these moral principles into, into your behavior. And it's not clear uh, how to resolve these two quite intuitive ideas. I think it m may depend on the type of decision at hand, and in particular in, in the studies that we've done involving harm. There's sort of this, again, visceral slowing down, put on the brakes, when you could do something that could harm somebody else that, that seems to be a signature of, of moral choice uh, in, in this particular setting. Hans, um, your brilliant linguistic observation, what was it, considerate, considerate and, and thoughtful? Considerate and thoughtful. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, are actually words that mean, we're taken to mean kind in yes. a sense. Or, yeah. Yes, exactly. And very, very interesting. La lady in the corner? Oh, well, one very quick question while we're handing the mic over. Is it also true that money that has involved some pain in the earning thereof is valued more highly than money that's just given to you for nothing? Uh, when it's for yourself, yes. Yeah, for yourself? Yes. So the interesting... <laughs> We're working on a, a pensions problem, and I had the weird theory that the, uh, the government pension rebate would have a higher perceived value if instead of just paying it to people automatically, you made them report to a government office every year and basically be subjected to electric shocks for half an hour before the rebate was paid, um, then actually the perceived value of the government money would be higher and you'd get more bang. I think that's great, don't you? I mean, you know, it brings back, you know, slightly Kafkaesque role of government, I grant you that. But, uh, lady, lady there in the corner. Sorry. Good luck with that. Thank you. Good luck, okay. I think it's a good policy. Thanks. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the implications of, like, the perceived lazy care staff. So imagine you've got a person that needs to be turned every half an hour, for example, otherwise they'll get bed sores. Would that link into hyperbolic discounting? Because you might not see their pain automatically. They would sort of, like, lead up eventually so mm. that oh I need to go just check my phone have a cup of tea go have a cigarette before I go to turn this person because their pain might not be automatically seen but you're still receiving that financial bonus being at work yeah that's a really interesting idea and there is research um, actually from uh, from my collaborator with Giles Story who who did the the dictator game studies that I that I showed earlier um, looking at how people discount for self versus others and it does seem to, to be the case that people discount the future differently for themselves and others. And, and so that's a very interesting question, how that difference might play into uh, individual choices that have a, an immediate payoff for you now, but a delayed benefit or a cost for somebody else later. That's a fantastic extra problem. Come and speak to us all. You're here for the rest of the day, is yes. that right? That's exactly the kind of brief I, 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 I really love, actually. That's fantastic. So Molly's here for the rest of the day. Thank you very much, Neil. I think that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. And really, really worthwhile and brilliant.